Hi there, hope you're having a great day so far. Well, the year 2020, what a year it has actually been for all of us Aussies so far. Let's think about it. We've had drought, we've had fire, significant fire, uh, floods, and now we're smack bang in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. It really is something like, like from a movie, really, really quite surreal, a really crappy movie if you're asking me. No, no doubt all of the challenging things um, that we've had to deal with this year and are still dealing with have had some effect on our children's conscious and subconscious minds. And really depending what level of exposure that they've actually had to all of these traumatic events that have been happening, possibly their mental health and their anxiety levels as well may have been affected. Now, as we are aware, um, on any given day, children's anxiety can come out in all sorts of different ways through tears and meltdowns, all of that stuff. <laughs> um, and we, all, we know that, that's, that when that does come out, it's obviously for no obvious reason. Um, but with what we're living through at the moment, we need to be mindful of their, their resilience and the impact all of these traumatic events is actually having on their emotions. Now, lucky for us today, we are joined by our very special guest, Sarah Cummings. Now, she's a co-founder and CEO of Teach TED, um, and she's gonna talk through a whole range of fun activities to help children manage their emotions and reduce their anxiety. And these are things I'm sure that parents all around Australia want to be able to know and need help with. Now, as an introduction, Teach Ted is a health tech startup, startup <laughs> and um, focused on changing the way that kids interact with medical treatment and all other challenging experiences. Now, Teach Ted is focused on reducing anxiety for children going to hospital or undergoing medical treatment um, or someone in their family who's going through medical treatment. Now, thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me. And can I introduce Ted? Hey Ted, how are you doing? I've never I'm having had a great day. People. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Ted. <laughs> now, Sarah, through your health tech startup, um, you've actually put together a whole range of fantastic um, support resources to help families during this time. Now, we'll, um, we'll speak about the article that we've published in just a few minutes, and that is jam-packed with links and videos and all kinds of wonderful resources. But um, as an introduction, can you just talk us through some of these resources that you've put together that, that families can access? Sure thing. So a bit of background, my co-founder Sarah and I started Teach Ted when our kids were younger and they and their siblings were going through medical treatment and at the time we were doing what all parents do, we were getting our kids to read books and play games around going to school and doing toilet training and things and we just couldn't find anything that would tell us about what was going to happen in that hospital experience. And I was doing volunteering with Playgroup New South Wales at the time and got put in touch with the child life therapist in the children's hospital. And they do this amazing job of helping kids who are going through obviously really serious treatment, play games with them so that they learn what to do. But a lot of the tools that they use are really quite straightforward. It's just that no one knew about them. And so we decided that we wanted to actually work with them to get all of that information out to families. So our first book is called Ted Goes to Hospital, and this is Ted. And it uses the uh, tools and techniques that they shared with us and they worked with us on some parent notes as well. So the parents feel geared up for it before they read the book to have really good discussions with their children and know the sorts of questions that they're going to ask. So it's about storytelling, but it's also about then turning that into the real world of playing with the toys and, you know, playing doctors and nurses and things like that, which is where Ted comes in. So Ted is handmade by a lovely lady in Victoria. And we use TED as a therapy tool for children to talk to. They feel a lot more comfortable often talking through a child. And also TED's part of our research program. So we're for purpose for profit, which means when we sell things on our shop and we sell toys like TED, then we use that money to give free resources to Royal Flying Doctors, Ronald McDonald House and Starlight, and also run research in this area. So we're parents too, and we just want to get as much information out to parents as we possibly can. That's wonderful. Well, you know, I think overall with hospitals, the large majority of us don't like visiting hospitals, and that's 
pretty much with, with good reason. The only time we actually like visiting a hospital is to welcome the birth of a newborn baby, pretty much. Mm. Um, but I understand that Teach Ted uses research-based play therapy techniques um, in a range of different research, research projects, as you've just mentioned. Um, and currently um, there's one being conducted by the behavioural science team at the University of New South Wales at Sydney's uh, Children's Hospital in Ran Ranwick. Just quickly, um, could you just give us a little bit of an overview um, of some of your findings from that, that research project and what you find has been relevant um, in general to children who are facing um, issues with anxiety? Sure. So the research project that we're focused on is for children who are having blood tests. One of the main reasons we focused on that is the people in the children's hospital have told us that when a child has a needle phobia, it makes everything else about their treatment so much harder. And unfortunately, usually the way we deal with children having needles is we get someone to hold them down. And it's because we're doing the very best that we can and we don't know anything else to do, but that can set them up for a really bad pattern as they go on later in life. So we did a survey last year of parents about their needle experiences. And one of the things we found was the parents who didn't prepare their children beforehand, it actually went worse than they were expecting it to be. Whereas the parents who had maybe taken their child for another blood test or talked to them about it before, it actually, they had a better experience than they had thought they were going to have. And the learnings that we're taking through to the, um, the pilot program we're running, we're running at Sydney Kids, which unfortunately has been put on a bit of a pause, as you can imagine at the moment, they're really dealing with critical only. Uh, but it's focused on if we can reduce anxiety for the child going in, then we can actually also reduce the amount of time it takes. And that makes the hospital system more efficient, meaning more people can get seen more quickly. So there's some huge flow on benefits for everyone in the health system. In terms of day-to-day -day, though, the same principles that work for a blood test work just as well for getting an injection. Or, you know, if this COVID test, they're talking about it becoming a finger prick, it's the same logic. So the techniques and the tools that we use can be applied to all sorts of situations. Um, and we know from the work that we've done and research that other people have done, children actually get a lot of their anxiety from the parents and the parents' anxiety is often through not knowing why and not knowing what to do about it. So if we can support the parents more effectively, then we can also help them support their children. Yeah, wonderful program and well done on that. And um, Thank you. you're looking forward to getting up and running again at the end, which hopefully is not going to be too far away, which we all mm. To the end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel with this pandemic at the moment. Well, we published your article and the title is Staying Cool Through COVID-19. For someone who hasn't read the article, can you please give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and just what inspired you to write it? Sure. Uh, so we've, I've got two kids of my own, so does my co-founder, and we have kids that react um, quite sensitively to different situations. So we've had to learn along the way what works and what doesn't. And we've applied a really easy four-step rule which goes along with the cool acronym so C is for cuddle time um, human touch always makes kids calm down and feel better and it doesn't necessarily have to be a big cuddle it might be that you sit side by side and read a story together um, it's just that proximity and spending time and knowing that you're there can really calm a child down um, I find when my kids are having tantrums it's often coming from a place of fear rather than anger and a good cuddle stops the screaming and turns it into them actually having the, the headspace to tell me what's really bothering them. Uh, the second one is O for open-ended questions. So I used to do this myself until the child life therapist suggested that it wasn't actually helping is I'd say things like, don't be scared, there's no need to be scared. But actually the child often hadn't thought there was a need to be scared until I'd put it into their head because they are looking at you constantly to see what's the right reaction in a different situation. It's, just, it's the way kids learn everything is by modelling behaviour. And so they taught me these magic words and it's called I wonder. So the best way to start a sentence is I wonder. I wonder what might make you, what you might like to do after you've had your test tomorrow. Or I wonder if, if Ted's feeling really scared, what do you think might help Ted? So the open-ended questions it gives them an opportunity to say whatever they like in a safe space without being worried that they're saying the wrong thing. So the third one is options. Um, kids are just like us. They like to feel in control. And for most kids, most of their life is outside of their control. But you'll find you get a much better experience from kids if they do feel like they have control, even over really simple things. So 
it might be something as simple if you have fights that I used to have with my daughter about what to wear every day. Would you like to wear the blue shirt or the green shirt? Now, I've already pre-chosen, so I'm not giving her an option that I'm not going to be happy with her having, but she feels like she has some control. And so she then chooses quite happily which one she wants to do and she'll go along her merry way. Whereas if I said, which one do you want out of all of these and she chose something that I didn't want, then, you know, we have an argument. So anywhere you can give them control uh, is always going to help. So, for example, if you're at a doctor, would you like to sit on the seat by yourself or would you like to sit on my lap? All things that you know you're going to be comfortable with, um, but that feeling of being in control even over the simple things will help dampen down their anxiety in other areas. Um, and the third one, the L, well, let's let the kid, the toys talk. So if you've ever seen anything on TV about play therapy with children, you'll find that they'll give the child a toy or they'll get them to draw. Well, the same thing works equally well for a child at home. And what you'll find is they will say things through a toy that they won't necessarily be comfortable saying in your face. Again, for that basis that they're worried that you may not agree with or approve of what it is that you've said. So one of the reasons we have a real life Ted Bear, and it works just as well with all your toys at home, is to actually talk through Ted. And that's really the power of the book as well. They take Ted through the hospital experience or in the digital version through a blood test. They can say things like, Ted's actually a little bit worried that when he goes to sleep, he might not wake up. Now, that's actually a fear that kids often have. And you'll find um, it's a bit hard to understand as an adult, but kids have no context. So when they hear hospitals, all they see is in the movies and things. People go to hospital and not very nice things happen. So they don't actually have the context to know that millions and millions of people every day come in and out of hospital with no trouble. So this is a way to get them to voice those fears that they may not otherwise voice to you. And then you can talk back through the toy as well. So Ted has this fear. Oh, I wonder what we might be able to do with Ted so that he feels more comfortable. Now, in our parent notes, we address a lot of these issues and give you some suggestions of how you can explain it. For example, with the not waking up, there's a doctor there who's looking after Ted all of the time to monitor how he's going and make sure that he sleeps just enough time so that the operation's over. So we provide all that information to you and that's all freely available on our website. The book's for sale in the shop. And as I said, we give some away when we sell some, but we do make the parent notes available for free in our tools area. Okay, great. So, so for a parent um, at the moment, um, if they were you know, having to take a, a child to hospital and or with any other um, stressful scenario, you, would you suggest it's best to be able to have the child speak to, to a, a toy to be able to get them to air out their, their thoughts and their feelings, as you just mentioned earlier, as opposed to asking yeah. them directly? And it, it depends on the child, right? So some kids are very comfortable and it depends on their age. It'll depend on why they are not feeling well. Um, you'll find that if a child's not feeling well, they regress a bit in their cognitive functions temporarily. Uh, or if they're feeling quite anxious, their cognitive functions tend to go back a little bit temporarily. So I'd suggest, you know, having a conversation with your child. You know your child really well. If there's someone who likes to talk things through face-to-face, -face, great. If not, I think you'll find using a toy helps. The other thing that I find helps is side-by-side -side conversations. So sitting with a child looking out away from each other or going for a walk or being in the car, um, they're all great ways to get your child to relax a bit and, and tell you things. I mean, you know, as a parent, the best way to get your child to talk to you is try and get on the phone and talk to someone else. <laughs> but yeah, I find the, the toys really do help um, just give them that freedom to speak. They don't yet have the cognitive ability to understand that we know it's them talking. So they really genuinely think that they've completely disconnected from it. Yep. Uh, what are some of the, I guess, the more common areas the kids are, are being concerned about right now? Look, I think the um, unpredictability. You know, I'm not a massive routine person, but our, our family still has certain routines. And particularly when school's on, they get up every morning, they go to school, they have particular activities, they see particular people, they're, they're losing all of that. Uh, and children, when things are unpredictable, they get very anxious because they just don't know what's going to happen. And as I mentioned before, they don't have a lot of control over things. So that unpredictability is really hard. And any way you can put your own routines into things, and it doesn't mean doing the same thing every day, but it just means... You know, we're looking now at drawing up a chart for Monday through Sunday and having particular activities in at particular times just to give them some, I guess, points throughout their day that are predictable, even if the rest of the day is quite unpredictable. 
Uh, obviously, all the talk about death rates on TV, um, you would have heard it many times, try and avoid having those sorts of things playing, but actually have the conversation with kids. One of the things they learnt through the bushfires was kids work much better if they have a plan. So previously, there'd been thought that it might scare the children to talk about what might happen if there's a fire, but actually they found it worked really well. So you can do the same thing with the lockdown. Let's sit down and agree as a family how we're going to get through this if we do end up in a lockdown situation where we can't leave the house. Let's book in some time to talk online to your friends and, you know, give them that certainty that someone is looking after them and they know what they're doing. Yes. That, they're the sorts of things that will really help kids. And the other thing is they're just cooped up. You know, try and get them outside if you can. Have a dance party in your kitchen. Anything you can do to get them moving. We know that when kids are moving, their anxiety levels drop. Yep. Okay, great. And how can parents really tell if their child is feeling anxious um, about everything that's happening? And if that's the case, what can they do to help? Yeah, it's, it's so hard because every child will show it differently. The thing that I always suggest looking out for is any unusual fears or phobias that have just recently popped up. So they might suddenly have a fear of the postman or not want to go to sleep in the dark or just, um, you know, worried about you leaving the house and asking a lot about what time you'll be back and what's going to happen next. Any of those sorts of things are signs that your child's starting to feel anxious about something and it might be what they're talking about, but a lot of the time it's actually a bit more deep-seated and it's too too much of a vague concept for them to be able to articulate so they pin it onto something that's tangible uh, so in those situations you know I think talking about things like I was mentioning before of sitting down and making a plan for I wonder what we could do so that um, we'll know what's going to happen next week maybe we could draw some pictures of what activities we're going to do each day um, you know go into all of those steps talk through the toys if you think that will help. Uh, I find my kids are actually older now, they're nine and 11, but I find they will still tell me things through the toys. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's worth a try at any age and, and let them play through it. You know, don't worry if they start to play some imaginary games that might seem a bit dark to you. They're really just trying to process things in their own head. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you are really concerned, they are doing telehealth now with a lot of the psychologists. So I highly recommend that you reach out to Kids Helpline and a whole range of resources that are available if you if you still feel like you need extra help. All right, cool. Um, and talking about um, learning or like, like learning through play, what does this actually mean in practice? Yeah, so you've seen kids do it from a very young age, right? They'll put on your shoes, they'll sit there trying to type on the laptop when they watch you do it. Kids learn everything by mimicry and by testing out how um, different dynamics work in relationships and what happens if I do this, that happens. What we know with younger children is they learn everything best through play. Um, I actually think it works with adults as well. You know, they say if someone tells you something, you hear about 10% of it. If they tell you and show you, you hear like 40%. If they actually get you to do it yourself, they, they learn about 70%. And then if they force you to teach someone else about it, you've, you've got it down pat. And it's the same process with kids. Um, but also with kids, they don't know what they are and aren't allowed to do. And playing is a really nice way to test that out. Having a semblance of control. So, for example, one of the activities we do in the digital school where they're giving Ted a blood test is they actually give him the blood test. And we've got some activities that we're working on at the moment around how to do that with your toy. And there's some simple things you can do, like use a ribbon for the tourniquet and use a syringe from your, your um, ibuprofen to, as the needle you'll be amazed at how much more comfortable they'll get by playing through something. So if you've got a difficult situation coming up, if you know, for example, that your child's going to be in the house for a long time, get a cardboard box and set up a little room that's their bedroom and, and set it up with their toys and say, right, well, what do you think Ted might do all day in here? What are some of the activities that we might like to do? There's a lot of research that shows learning through play, particularly in a medical basis, it desensitises children to whatever it is that's fearful for them, but it also gives them a framework to be able to talk really openly because, as I said before, they're talking in third party, not about themselves. Okay, great. Well, look, there's a lot of information, I guess, for parents to be able to take in, um, and it's all... Um, just as important as, as one another. So how would you paraphrase, I guess, and summarise everything that we've spoken about today? What are the key points you think that parents really need to sort of take away from this chat today? 
Yeah, I think it's really that cool uh, acronym, you know, make sure you spend lots of time cuddling your kids or reading stories with them or just being near them. Focus on giving open-ended questions. Give them lots of options that they can have control over on a day-to-day -day basis and get the kids get the toys involved, you know, play, let them play through the toys, in, sit down and play with them with the toys and you'll be amazed at the conversations that will come out. And, you know, jump onto the website and read those parent notes because you'll find it, it really sets you up and makes you feel much more comfortable having some of those more challenging conversations. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today and well done on, um, on everything you. together with the business. Ted's been very well behaved, I have to say that. He's very well behaved. He's super, super cuddly at the moment. Yeah. Only we've had him in the front window for the bear hunt. Yeah. <laughs> so he's excited to be out. Yeah. If parents have got any um, questions for you and they would like to get in touch with you or someone in the business, um, where's the best place to find you? Yeah, so our website, teachted.com.au. We're also on Facebook and Instagram under the handle teachted. And, you know, we'd love to hear uh, from people. If anyone's interested in getting an early view of the parent notes for the blood test, please feel free to get in touch and, and we're happy to send those out as well. We just haven't put them up on the website yet because they're still going through the testing phase. All right, thanks, Sarah. And we really look forward to having another chat with you, hopefully in the not too distant future. Take care. Absolutely. And thank thanks so much for having us. Bye. Bye.